I live near the sea and the dreamer in me loves the idea of sailing around the world. What an adventure. Feeling the wind in the sails, listening to the slop of water on the hull, the bird call in the early morning, or the morning chorus depending how you see that, the sun rising majestically over the horizon, visiting new lands, crossing the equator, learning new languages. Well, the romantic in me needs to get shoved out of the way by the pragmatist, who's also known as my wife, who would tell me that even with a GPS I can get lost 2Ks from home in a car. But I can live my life vicariously through books and well-known Kiwi author Tessa Duda has written a wonderful work. It's called First Map, How James Cook Charted Aotearoa New Zealand. I loved it and I've asked her in for a chat. Mm, thank you, Gary. I wondered what the conversation must have been like with Captain Cook when his bosses called him into their offices and said, James, we've got a job for you. Uh, yes, they had chosen him ahead of other older and more experienced uh, captains. And the reason for that was that he'd established a reputation as a very fine surveyor. In other words, a maker of charts over in Canada and Quebec and Newfoundland. And they were mounting an expedition sponsored by the Royal Society and King George III and the Royal Navy to go around the bottom of Cape Horn and then up to um, Tahiti to measure the uh, to observe the transit of Venus. And that was all Cook knew at that point. And so, yes, it must have been a very exciting moment. He was only 39, um, younger than most, and he knew he was going to be given a collier. Now, a collier was the ship that he'd been sailing in for the last 10 years, um, and it suited him very well. So they're the boats with a very narrow, sort of shallow bottoms on them. Well, yes, yeah. also, but they've got a very deep hull. And into that hull they loaded a monstrous amount of stores, uh, rice, flour, cocoa, sauerkraut to keep scurvy at bay, and also an astonishing amount of liquor. Uh, the reason for that was that they didn't drink much water because the water, um, they didn't seem to have caught it from the skies. Um, they preferred ale. So each man was en entitled to eight pints of, of beer a day. Now, for 94, <laughs> 94 men, that's just lot, imagine... That's a lot of beer. That's a lot of beer. And they would have stopped off, uh, stocked up in uh, Madeira and uh, Rio on the way down to Cape Horn. And they tried brewing it in New Zealand as well. Um, but that actually was the only way the sailors really got their, enough liquid. So from, mm. uh, from Great Britain all the way around the world, and eventually they end up in, in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And a couple of hundred years after that, You've written this wonderful book, this yeah. wonderful book. And the cover of it is, 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 am, is amazing. Look at that, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is lovely. It was designed in Australia, and I have to say they've done a wonderful job. And David Elliott was my first choice as the artist, and he has a personal interest in maps as well. So how, he was delighted to be, be involved. How important was it for you to have a map of New Zealand on the cover? Well, that's what the book's all about. So that it's about sense, yeah? how he charted New Zealand because New Zealand as a country, or as two islands which sit there in the South Pacific, was totally unknown in the Northern Hemisphere. All they knew was Tasman's scrap of coastline which had been um, charted in 1642. Go back, if you will, mm -hmm. to the boat that he came to New Zealand on. Mm -hmm. you know, we think of big luxury liners, but his boat, <laughs> that's not that big, is it? No, it's not. Uh, it's relatively short, but it is, it's like a brick. It was very square and could take a huge amount of stores. And they knew they were going on a long voyage and they had 94 people on board when they left, left England. That was, uh, some of those were Joseph Banks and his party and because he was a botanist who wanted to do this trip and uh, he had a secretary and a couple of artists and servants and a, black, uh, and a dog and so they um, took, the, uh, took the crew up to 94. They lost three en route but before they got to Tahiti but they still had 91 and that's <laughs> about three times, twice as many as they, a collier would normally take. I was talking to a lady on a, on a flight recently and uh, she had just got off a, a plane from Dubai and she said, never again, 17 hours of my <laughs> life. The, the longest flight, I just, I can't imagine how I could ever do that again. Yeah. Captain Cook would have loved to have done it in 17 hours. He would indeed, because this ship was very uh, slow, very lum um, cumbersome and it would barely go to windward, which means that it was not manoeuvrable in any normal sense as we understand it. 
Does that make then his mapping of New Zealand even more impressive? Because oh, absolutely. Because there's so many things that you wouldn't have been able to do. Yeah. And another thing was that there are two ways of sort of drawing a coastline. One, you can go ashore and, uh, with instruments and, and establish all sorts of uh, angles. Um, the other way is to do, do it all by dead reckoning, which is, means you stay out at sea as close as you can get. You read the signs if there are going to be any reefs ahead of you or hidden rocks. But it took a huge amount of courage to sail as close as he did. And he, in the index, there's seven entries for under the heading Near Disasters in New Zealand. So he nearly uh, ship, was shipwrecked on several occasions. Even more impressive when you realise how many ships have been wrecked on New Zealand coasts in the last couple of hundred years. Yes. Well, I put you, that any little, idea? How yeah, many? well, it's in the book. I put a little postscript in there is to say that despite all the modern um, instruments that ship's captains now have, something, oh, I can't remember the figure, it's something over two and a half thousand. Yeah, crazy. And yeah. yet he managed to get that ship around there, make do his charts, um, keep his crew happy, and increasingly realised that there were... Um, he was very lucky that he had Tupaya with him. That turned out to be the most amazing benefit. And who was Tupaya? Tupaya was a Tahitian priest and navigator whom he'd picked up in Tahiti because Tupaya had said he was um, very keen to sail on with them. He was a man of apparently a great intellectual capacity, uh, curiosity, and a man of huge stature in Tahiti. He joined in Tahiti and sailed on, and when they had finished with the transit of Venus, they then sailed south to try and find the great southern continent, which they believed must exist to balance the um, land mass up in the, in a of Asia. So it wasn't to discover New Zealand no. as, as such at all? No. Because a lot of us get a wee bit sort of confused and we think that's either Captain Cook or Abel Tasman, and it's... It's well, good to, to draw the line in the sand and actually go, hang on a second here. <laughs> Tasman had drawn this scrap from about Hokitika up to Cape Ranga. And Cook knew about that. He had ca uh, Tasman's journals in, in his cabin. Uh, so he knew that if he sailed south and then he turned at 40 degrees latitude, he would finally, he must meet up with the coast. But he didn't know what was between his ship and, and Tasman's coast. Had no idea. And literally no idea because no one had been there before, right? Well, it's debatable that Tupaya might, he might have known of this very much larger two islands that were sitting down in the South Pacific, well to the south. Um, I don't think scholars are quite key, um, clear about that, but he certainly knew of what I think the figure is 130 islands in the Pacific. Was Captain Cook a, a good man? Oh, I believe so, yes. Because uh, I, I ask the question because that's the, 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 the picture that we probably most associate with him, right? Yeah. He's got that sort of very sort of learned look. But, of course, when he arrived that first time, mm. there, there was a bit of tragedy and, and... Well, misunderstandings. Cook had been given very clear instructions that he was to treat the, any Indigenous people he came across with respect and acknowledgement that, that those were their lands that he came, he was only to use any form of violence or, or firearms and self-defence. And so when people sort of say that he marched ashore and shot the first person he saw, that is a very um, misleading way of putting it. In fact, he was distraught. Both he and Banks were absolutely distraught with the five probably who were killed on the first, uh, first two days. So do you think we need to re-educate ourselves as to what really happened. Absolutely. How do and, we do that then? Well, I hope my book is a small contribution. <laughs> I'm sure Because it is. I, I read, well, just to go back to Tupaya for an instance, um, what happened on those first two days, Tupaya did not go ashore on the first day, but he did on the second. And there were some moments of standoff, but there was a moment which is very clearly described um, by not only Cooks and Banks journals, but also the 12 or so others that were, were kept during the voyage. There was a moment when, into a silence, Tupaya called out in Tahitian and the Māori understood him. And I'm describing that as one of the great moments in New Zealand history because it meant that from that point onwards, Cook had a, an interpreter and a mediator and he was able to explain to these people that he only came in peace uh, to really collect three things ashore. That's the only reason he landed, really, was to collect firewood for uh, cooking in the galley uh, fresh water, because they don't seem to have collected it from the skies, 
which seems a bit strange to us because, you know, we're very used to collecting water, um, putting it in, in barrels or whatever. And the other thing that he collected was puha. Um, he called it wild celery. But that, for him, that was very essential um, for keeping scurvy at bay. So that was why he came ashore in the first place. So he, ca he came from England to Tahiti, and then the second part of his mission was to try and figure out if there was the Great South Land, yeah. and if he could find it, map it. And he sailed south, and then he got fed up because the sailors <laughs> were getting grumpy, and he could see there was no land. There was no sign of anything remotely um, indicating that there was land down there. So he started to sail west, and that's when he eventually, on the 7th of October, um, saw the hills behind Gisborne. You talked a wee bit earlier about um, the botanist banks being on board. Mm. They must have loved it when they ah. eventually got to, to land and to see some of the things that they saw and, and, and the pictures that they could Absolutely. they could draw of, of our birds. Yep. Just beautiful. Oh, they took about 30,000 specimens back. And Sidney Parkinson's drawings, which he did, are absolutely glorious. Now, that one is uh, David Elliott, who is a, this wonderful artist who's contributed so much to this book. Um, in, when they got to Ship Cove and Mary Toto in the uh, uh, Queen Charlotte Sound, um, they were Banks wrote lyrically about the wonderful bird song that he heard there, and uh, the kokako and the and the rimu. Um, sorry, not the rimu, the rata. Um, that they saw on the hillside. So there's some wonderful passages describing the, the, the beauty of the landscape. I, I often had in my head that he just sailed around New Zealand and just wrote, drew the map as he went around. But of mm -hmm. course, he went, he went ashore as well. And here's the shot where he's in his pinnace yes. going, going up a river. What, what, what happened there? Well, they went um, from Gisborne. They sailed, eventually sailed north and went into Fitianga. And then after that, they sa sailed around the end of the Coromandel Peninsula and uh, went down into the Firth of Thames and anchored there and Cook and took the boat and his party with marines and uh, sailors and uh, Banks and co and Tupaya. And they went about 23 miles up the Waiho River. Now, the, the point about that picture is that the, all those wonderful kahikatea trees, which were there at the time, are no longer there. If you drive across the Thames Plains, they are plains, you know, almost largely devoid of trees. So all those great trees have gone yeah. in, in the 250 years since. Beautiful illustrations in the yes, book. Yes, it's lovely. Just, I mean, just... David, uh, I so love his work and um, I was delighted when he, uh, when he said he'd like to be involved. Tell me about this next shot because I think this is really, this is really lovely. I can almost feel the emotion <laughs> yes. at the moment. Yeah, well, that's a famous, another famous moment of New Zealand yeah. history was when young Nicholas, or Nicholas Young is his proper name, but he was up the, uh, on the masthead and uh, he saw land and yelled out, land ahoy. And of course, the, the, the ship had been at sea for um, weeks, many weeks. And so they would have all rushed up on deck. And Can there it was. And so he was shouting, land ahoy, you know. Can I tell you that... Mm -hmm. In t today's world, that's a health and safety issue, right? Oh, yes. Right there, Ted. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there was no such thing as a harness on board those ships. <laughs> <laughs> and not only is it a health and safety issue, but he got a lot of rum for making He did. It, he got a gallon of rum. <laughs> Whole gallon, which presumably he, he um, spread around his friends. And, uh, yeah. One of the nice things about reading the book is you see all the names that he called all the various places mm. that he went past. Mm. And he ex the book explains why they're named like that. Yeah, there's that, a story kind of behind every one. Yeah. Um, and again, there's been criticism from people who say, why didn't he, you know, he shouldn't have given them English names, they should be Maori names. But he, he only landed in, in nine, eight places. So he wouldn't have known as he sailed past, uh, he wouldn't have known what the Maori name was, and neither would Tapaya, of course. So I think that's a little unfair to say that he shouldn't have given them the names that we're so familiar with. So now it's, uh, it's well into the 2000s and we see it through different eyes. We do. Do you believe we should be changing the names back to the original names? <laughs> well, we are in that process of doing so. I mean, we've done it with Mount Cook um, and I think it's happening with Gisborne, which the Māori name there is Tūranganui Akiwa and we're starting to use that a lot. So I think it's, it's, almost, it's almost inevitable in a way, but 
I'd like to think that we can continue to use both because both have a story. Yes, and Ar- Araki, Mount Cook. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and this is our heritage. This is our dual cu- um, culture that we uh, we want to preserve, I believe. Yeah, I flew into mm. Nelson not too long ago and, yeah. the, and the, the lady on the plane said, welcome to Nelson Whakatū. Yeah, and it, well, there you go. And it made sense. Yeah. 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 The, the charting of the South Island, is it true that when he started he didn't land from... All the way around, he he left and then all he, around before he he'd spent some time in Ship Cove, Meditoto in um, Queen Charlotte Sound, and when he left there, he ran um, the the you can't you actually can see them there, but just off the north east corner there is an island, which um, he very nearly got shipwrecked on. It was a, the closest run thing. Once he'd cleared that in the middle of the night, he's then set uh, set a course down the down the, west, uh, the eastern coast there. Um, it's interesting that most people of my generation and possibly even our daughters, um, is that he made two mistakes. I know what you're going to talk about, Banks yeah. Peninsula. Banks and Peninsula and Stewart, Stewart Island. Island yeah. And I have done a bit of research and very, I'm very confident that he only made a mistake with, with Banks Peninsula. He, he named it an island. And the reason for that is simply the weather. He just couldn't get close enough to be certain. But when we get down to the star, um, to Stewart Island, uh, the, the the chart which we have used is, no, is known as Folio 16 in the British Library, and on that first chart there is no penins- there's no isthmus sorry between um, Stewart Island and the mainland, and I have it on very good authority. Somebody who's a, a world uh, scholar of Cook's charts that in fact he wasn't certain enough, again because of the weather, he couldn't get close enough, and so he didn't draw it in at all. So how did the wee lines end up there then? The engravers put them in. Naughty boys. Yes. As soon as they got, well, what I was told was that engravers hated uncertainty, and when they got back to England, um, they started preparing the charts to put in a book, which was published in 1773, Um, and they drew those little dots in, to indicate that there could have been an isthmus there. And Cook was not very pleased with that publication. He felt there, there was, um, it wasn't a, a true, um, well, yeah, he, he, was just, uh, he was just unhappy with the editing and the, the charts they'd used. So when he uh, wrote the official journal of the second voyage, which was to um, dispel forever the idea of a, of a great southern continent, um, when he got back then, he insisted that he wrote his own journal and it was published with his, uh, with his approval. I get that, Tessa, but for a lot of people, there is this whole idea that our history did not begin with Cook. So how do we really teach that <laughs> so that it makes sense? I think we have dispelled, hopefully, completely for good, that Cook discovered New Zealand. Um, one hears that they're still teaching that in Australia, that he, covered, that he discovered Australia, which is so wrong on so many counts that we, we're going to forget that. But as far as we, we go, we've, st- we've stopped saying that Cook discovered New Zealand, but only in the last probably 50 years. But can we say that he charted New Zealand? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there was no European chart before, except for that little bit of, um, of uh, Tasman's. Uh, coastline, uh, we can certainly say that he, he, provide, he provided the Northern Hemisphere cartographers and geographers with the first full chart of New Zealand. And the astonishing thing about it is, is just how accurate it is. Because he had no chronometer, uh, he didn't have one until his second voyage, so he couldn't really measure longitude, that's the lines that go up and down. He could measure latitude all right, but not longitude. And so he only had a lunar method, which involved a great deal of mathematics um, to measure longitude. So he didn't do it very often. There's a wonderful uh, illustration in your book yeah. where it has the map of New Zealand that Captain, Captain yeah. Cook gave us. Mm. And then with red lines, and I hope you can see it, oh, yes. is, is what it is today. Yeah. That seems to me to be incredibly close. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why when I grew up with this, this chart on the walls of many an office or a school or a batch or whatever. Um, the, I've always known, because I've married into a sailing family and, um, and know a lot of friends who are mariners, particularly square rig mariners, they, are, they have always 
said that that, uh, that map is just absolutely astonishing in, in its placement in this vast ocean that we sit in. So you sailed from Australia to New Zealand? Yes, I did. Yeah. So can you remember the moment that you saw New Zealand again? Yes, I can, very easily. What was that like? Well, the trip took about 12 days, and for the first four days I was confined to my bunk, absolutely sick as a dog. It was horrible. Um, but after that, the weather calmed down and the boat stopped rocking, you know, like this. And um, as it, uh, over in, on one beautiful moonlit night, we, we sighted the, the coast of the, the um, profile of the Three Kings Islands. And it just gave me a tiny little bit of insight into what it's like to close a coast, to see that land for the first time. You know, somebody shouted, land ahoy, and, and you know, time-honoured fashion. And we all rushed on deck, and there it was, in the moonlight, full moon. And just I could just get a glimmer of understanding of what it's like to be in a ship that will barely go to windward. It's very slow. So when you say it, it can barely go to windward, yeah. it, it has to have the sail, the wind behind it? Is that, is behind it or to the right angles. And that's it? Yeah. More or less, it, it could sail slightly ahead of that right angle uh, moment, um, but essentially it couldn't sail to windward. So that makes it even more impressive Absolutely. when you consider that he sailed around New Zealand. Absolutely. Because the, yeah. what is it, the lee shore is the dangerous Absolutely, shore? yeah. Well, that's why he wouldn't go into Dusky Sound. Uh, he sailed past that, much to Cook uh, Banks' absolute fury. Um, he bullied him and pressured him and said, we must go in there. And Cook said, no, I'm not going. Because once we go in, we'll, we will probably never get out for possibly weeks on end. So is it just sort of a sign of the times that Captain Cook came when he got to the New Zealand part to, to chart New Zealand and to dispel the theory that there was a southern continent? Banks just wanted to come and draw pictures of yeah. all, the, all, the, all the animals and well, plants and stuff, and no one actually sat down to think about if there was somebody here, what their rights to the land were or how they lived? No, I don't think that's quite right. That um, Banks, uh, sorry, Cook was given very explicit instructions before he left that he was to treat the uh, native people uh, with great respect and deference and could only claim for George III if he, with the consent of the, of the local people. People forget that. So that was one thing. Um, and the other thing was that at the end of his journals, he started to write a long essay on what he'd observed of Maori life um, as they'd, the various places they'd landed in. Uh, from Fitianga, they landed in Bay of Islands, spent quite a bit of time in there. And there's a long description in there, but uh, also with Banks, but particularly Cook, he got more and more interested in the Māori as a race and what he could see of their gardens, um, that the, how f skillful they were as fishermen, um, the waka that they built, the, um, the way they uh, could use their waka for long passages. Uh, he observed their clothing and their tattoos. Uh, he was obviously increasingly um, fascinated by them. So he came once and then he came again? He came three times. So what was the reason for the second trip? The second trip was to uh, put to bed once and for all the idea of the Great Southern Continent. So he spent a great deal of time going backwards and forwards across the southern Pacific, south of Tahiti, and then again on, uh, in the Indian Ocean. He went right down to the Antarctic um, ice shelf and took back to England his absolute certainty there was no Great Southern Continent. So that was the second trip yep. and then the third trip, which the was third the one trip, that he died in, right? Yes, well, that was probably in hindsight a, a tragic mistake. Um, by then the emphasis had shifted to finding the Northwest Passage, which they again, they believed, had to exist around the top of Canada. As a trading route, it would be a great find. Um, so he went right up to uh, Siberia and Alaska, uh, um, charted a lot of the lands up there the coastline, and then he went back to Hawaii for the summer and outstayed his welcome, basically. And when he had to go back a second time because the ship needed repair, that's when things turned really sour and eventually um, he was killed on the beach. Tessa, how do you mm -hmm. think we as New Zealanders and Australians should remember Captain Cook? Well, I think we need to re-establish his story because I think it's been forgotten. And my hobby horse is that we've been, we've been shortchanging our children for the last two generations. We have not been telling them the great stories of our, of our past, both the pre-European, the Māori 
um, 600 years or so before the Europeans started to arrive. We've largely forgotten the story of, of Cook and his charting and his importance. And I think we need to, I mean, I'm absolutely thrilled that the government is um, reinstating history as a core subject because we've got a wonderful history, but there are two or three generations of children out there who've never been taught any. Tessa, uh, if you was... look at the, um, uh, the curriculum, it's unbelievably woolly. It says nothing about, you know, that they shall teach New Zealand history and we need... So we've got a great, we've got a real big challenge in front of us. Because it is important that we get history right, because if we don't learn from the mistakes of history, we will repeat those mistakes. Absolutely. Yeah. And unfortunately, we do go on re repeating some of them, not all of them, but, you know, there's so much we can learn about, about the uh, pre-European Māori life and then, of course, the encounters, um, which started with Cook and then went on, and they have been wonderfully well-researched by Anne Salmond, so when people say these stories haven't been told, I'm not absolutely sure that's true. They have been told, but they haven't translated into um, the sorts of stories we're telling our children. So I think it's absolutely wonderful that we're going to start, you know, re revitalising. Tessa, congratulations on a, a wonderful book Thank because you. you, of course, are just a wonderful storyteller. Thank you. And this is just a, a, a lovely book called First Map, How James Cook Charted Aotearoa New Zealand and some beautiful insights. Thanks for your time here on A Very Tall Man. It's been a pleasure. Thank God, you. God bless you. Thank you.